I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. I'm Andrew Falkowski, and I'm joined by my trusty co-host, Taylor Sparks. We're here at the University of Utah in the Material Science and Engineering Department. We're super passionate about material science, new discoveries, technology in general, and we just didn't see a great material science podcast available, so we created one. We plan on covering a lot of different topics on cool materials, both old and new, processing, characterization, and even entrepreneurship, where new materials generate market innovations. There's so much to cover. After all, the whole world is made of materials. But today, today we're going to talk about maybe the most important and ubiquitous material of them all, that's steel. Now, in order to fully understand the tremendous impact that steel had on the development of civilizations, it's important to recognize how limited the materials were that came before it. By increasing efficiency and enabling humans to craft elaborate structures, tools were crucial to the development of civilization and often determined the winners and losers of economic, cultural, and territorial conflict. In fact, materials have really shaped society, and we will no doubt talk about many of these materials in greater detail in future episodes. But for now, let's do a quick recap of how man traveled from the Stone Age through the Bronze Age and Iron Ages before arriving at steel. So during the Stone Age, materials were used to make tools were really pretty rudimentary. For example, flint and chert, which is just a hard sedimentary rock formed from quartz crystals, these were chipped and shaped into cutting tools. Sandstone and basalt were often used for grinding, wood, bone, shell. These were used in a variety of applications, and these materials are characterized by having really a low hardness and low strength. Under stress, these materials fracture easily, and as such, they're really limited in what they can be used for. This meant that most structures were built within the boundaries of human strength. For example, the first known man-made structures in Africa consisted of a simple arrangement of stones to hold branches of trees in position. By contrast, metal tools offered significant advantages in strength, hardness, and ductility. Copper tools were some of the first metal tools to emerge within societies. These were made by refining copper from a greenish rock called malachite. These tools dramatically increased the structures and technologies that humans could build. For example, it was through the use of copper tools that, you know, the great pyramids in Egypt could be built. Wait, so you're saying it wasn't the aliens? The alien theory is no good? Unfortunately not. However, building the pyramids was certainly a miracle. It's estimated that in Egypt, 10,000 tons of copper ore were mined throughout Egypt to create over 300,000 chisels. Now, copper is, however, still very soft, meaning that the sculptors had to sharpen the copper chisel every three hammer strikes. And while this certainly wasn't ideal, it was a massive step up and allowed, them, allowed you know, people to create greater structures. Eventually, people discovered that copper could be enhanced by combining it with different elements to form bronze. So wait, when exactly was this? We're going from the Stone Age now into the Bronze Age. What time period are we looking at? So this occurred sometime between 3000 and 1000 BC, and it was pretty regionally independent. You know, it started up in various places, you know, sort of in Asia and in Europe, and it's kind of hard for researchers to nail down where exactly it started. This discovery marked a transition to the Bronze Age, and initially bronze was made out of copper and arsenic, forming arsenic bronze. It was later discovered that tin could be added to form an even stronger copper alloy. Now, Due to the rarity of arsenic and tin, complex trade routes across the Middle East were developed to help fuel the production of bronze. At the time, bronze was a form of social status and proved a useful tool. Okay, so I thought that iron was actually around during the Bronze Age. How come it wasn't being used instead? So the existence of iron was known during the Bronze Age, however, it was extremely rare, and bronze was actually generally harder than the iron that they could produce at the time. Iron's rarity stemmed from the fact that, you know, exposed iron deposits oxidized and were only present in an unrefined ore. Because of this, most of the iron harvested during the Bronze Age actually came from meteorites. The rarity of iron tools in this time period made it a material suited for kings. Tutankhamun, for example, was found buried with an iron dagger. The composition of such was similar to a meteorite that researchers found nearby. You know, something I learned is that this rarity, it also actually defined boundaries between civilization. I remember in the Old Testament that the Jews actually had to go to their Philistines, this ancient rival, in order to have things like plows and other tools made out of iron for them. Yeah, the production of bronze was contingent on the availability of arsenic and tin through those Middle Eastern trade routes previously mentioned. 
Now, when these trade routes collapsed, the production of bronze slowed and iron began to rise to prominence. Um, you know, thinking of iron, it reminds me of, you know, one of my favorite authors, Rudyard Kipling, he wrote this poem called Cold Iron, and in it he says, you know, gold is for the mistress, silver for the maid, copper for the craftsman cunning at his trade. Good, said the baron sitting in his hall, but iron, cold iron, is the master of them all. Yeah, so this transition to iron, it wasn't exactly easy either, though. In order to begin using iron in any sort of useful capacity, people had to learn how to make larger batches at a time. You can't just make a single dagger. We need to talk about significant amounts of iron. And this required innovating new smelting furnaces. And the first key innovation was the bloomery furnace. Bloomeries were used to create iron by the Spaniards in what's been called the, uh, the, the so-called Catalan Forge, which allowed you know the seven times greater yield. Seven times. Can, can you put that number into perspective for me? Yeah, so this was an increase from basically 50-pound batches up to 350-pound batches. And the way they did this is they stacked the iron ore up next to the charcoal, and then they would blow air on it using billows so that this would carry carbon monoxide from the charcoal over the steel. What this did is it had a reducing effect on the iron ore, turning the iron ore into iron metal. And subsequent versions of bloomeries included things called the Stuckoven or the Wolf Oven in Austria. And this had another 100% increase in per batch yield. And, you know, these ovens started to get so large that really they required way more air than a simple billows could provide. So they actually began to utilize water and wind power to generate the air blast necessary. It's pretty cool to see that Europe was able to, you know, escape the dark ages using renewable sources of energy. Yeah, I think it's really awesome. I'd love that we could actually uh, take inspiration from this as we face similar challenges today and think about what renewable could do for us. In any case, up until this point, iron production was still on a batch basis, and that's problematic. So the next significant improvement in furnaces is what's called the flus oven or the flow oven. This was developed in now we're in the 14th century, and what it allowed for was the production of iron in a continuous fashion rather than batch. The way that these worked is you basically top loaded, you know, the top you put in ore and charcoal at the top, and you kept on adding it, and as these materials burned, they would work their way down to the bottom where you had liquid iron being produced. And remarkably, you know, our modern day furnaces for the initial iron ore processing work, these work on essentially the same principle, except that we run them at higher pressures, right? The higher air pressure is the reason why we call these now today blast furnaces. Okay, so if I remember correctly, these flow ovens were not actually capable of reaching the melting temperature of iron, uh, which is 1500 degrees Celsius. And as a result, blacksmiths, you know, weren't they limited to shaping the iron by hammering it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, traditional iron, they actually called it wrought iron. Wrought means, you know, to work on something, wrought iron. It couldn't be melted, so instead you had to hammer it or hot forge it, which is when you're hammering on it when it's in that hot state. And you're also doing this in the presence of what's called slag. And this is this sort of molten leftover material from the iron ore. It's made up of iron, but it's also got silicon oxides in it. Um, and the hammering of wrought iron to expel the slag from it is really what gives wrought iron its characteristic fibrous structure and properties. If you've been to like a, uh, a county fair and you've seen these like handcrafted blacksmith things, that's all sort of wrought iron. It has that typical look because of the way that it's manufactured. And wrought iron is what we would call today mild or low carbon steel because it typically contained just a little bit of carbon, right? On the other hand, if iron is allowed to alloy with even larger amounts of carbon, and we're talking about maybe now between two and four weight percent, um, then the melting point is significantly reduced down to like 1150 C. And this is reachable in the furnaces at the time. Therefore, if you add enough carbon, you end up with a castable liquid that can be formed. And that's why we call this liquid cast iron, right? Once it solidifies, it becomes cast iron as opposed to wrought iron. And you know, in the early days, blacksmiths, they really had no use for cast iron because all this extra carbon in the structure made it way too brittle to be worked afterwards. You couldn't pound on it with a sledgehammer without it just fracturing. But with a little bit of time, they figured out that, hey, we can actually cast these things into useful shapes that don't require working afterwards. And so they started making things like church bells, cannons, and cannonballs out of cast iron. And, you know, being able to cast molten metal, this led to future furnace innovations. For example, pig iron is made by casting molten iron into sand trenches. The central trench is where the liquid is cast, and then you've got small ingots coming off on either side, and it looks kind of like a sow suckling small piglets, hence the name pig iron. This casting process has all sorts of manufacturing advantages, but this pig iron that's produced is actually not great quality. It's got way too much carbon, it's got lots of impurities, and so we needed a subsequent furnace innovation, and this was called the puddling furnace that could do something with this pig iron. Essentially what it did is it converted low-grade iron into this higher-value iron. 
Andrew, can you give me an explanation as to how this puddling furnace actually worked? Yeah, so in a puddling furnace, the molten pig iron is exposed to what's called an oxidizing atmosphere, which reacts with impurities in the pig iron, such as silicon. These impurities rise to the top in form of slag, which are then scraped off the top. The temperature is then increased in order to burn off the carbon present in the iron. And the result is actually quite astounding. As carbon is removed from the iron, its melting point increases. This causes chunks of pure to low car- carbon iron to float to the surface of the molten pig iron. Wait a minute. So solid, pure iron, it floats on the top of the rest of this liquid iron? Yeah, that's right. The process here is pretty similar to the effect of adding salt to ice. The addition of salt lowers the melting point of ice and causes it to melt. In this case, the addition of carbon has the same effect. With the removal of that carbon, the melting point of iron increases and it returns to a solid state. Additionally, in a similar vein to ice, iron is less dense in its solid state, so it floats to the surface. Now, these chunks were then rolled in a mill to produce iron bars. Uh, the process took around 12 hours and was extremely labor intensive. Now, as you can imagine, you know, all these furnace and smelting innovations were complicated and required financing. In the first century's common era, the Roman Empire was large and powerful enough to finance large metallurgy and mining operations, such as those in the Rio Tinto, Spain. However, subsequent European city-states and nations lacked the resources necessary to finance these, you know, these large-scale iron production. Yeah, at the same time, it was becoming clear that iron ore was just way more prevalent in the Earth's crust than all the materials that were needed in order to make bronze. And as a result, the potential existed for all these different cities across Europe to begin manufacturing iron with the materials that were all around them. And this had a democratizing effect. You know, all of a sudden, small villages could produce iron and then use these materials to make better tools. And then they could establish trade and commerce. And something that I don't think many people realize is that the large-scale production of non-state entities was intimately tied to the birth of capitalism, right? So at first, the costs needed to provide for large-scale smelting operations was covered by only a few wealthy banking families, such as the Fuggers and the Welsers in southern Germany. By by 1565, a German engineer, Hochstetter, who had been trained in sort of the German manner of mining, he was actually hired by Queen Elizabeth I to run England's mines. Hochstetter established what's called the Company of Mines Royal, where he, and this is a quote, Determined to join with him in company diverse others, in that respect, doth mean to make dividend of the commodities and profits. Did you catch that? This represented a truly first-of-its-kind new venture. This was the birth of a joint stock company where, you know, corporation financing was really made possible by all the shareholders who came together and then they divided the profits afterwards. Now, this sort of instance where a private entity is now taking over and leading innovation in, you know, the stead of a state uh, definitely has a lot of modern parallels. And, you know, we often see today a lot of private companies that are leading innovation where the state will not, you know, for instance, cybersecurity. Yeah. Or you could say like SpaceX doing contract uh, flights to outer space as opposed to NASA. Um, So, yeah, absolutely. This was the birth of something where individuals rather than state entities could drive really cool technological innovation. So again, going back to this Mines Royal Company, companies like this one and others that formed, they soon became so powerful that they had whole kingdoms in their debt. For example, Charles VII of France, he was so indebted to a guy named Jacques Coeur that he simply threw him in jail. He had him arrested, threw him in jail, and he confiscated all of his mines. But in England, there was something called the Magna Carta, and this provided some protections for private ownership, and it placed some limits on what the monarchy could do. And what this did is it had the result of leaving lots of these big iron corporations in private hands. And these private corporations, they're now poised to provide the iron, which would eventually drive the Industrial Revolution. Initially, this demand for iron was tied to firearm sales and weaponry, and this was big business. England was leading the way. And what sort of weaponry are we talking about here? Yeah, at the time, it was really used for cannons and cannonballs, mostly. Um, In fact, of all the iron that was being produced in Europe, Britain was producing half of it. And this provided, obviously, an enormous source of income for Britain as they sold this, often illegally, to other European countries. And, you know, ironically, the Spanish Armada, when they invaded Britain in 1588, they did so using British-made cannons and cannonballs, which had been smuggled out of the country. Hmm. Using the weapons Britain sold them against Britain. Sounds pretty familiar. Yeah, some interesting modern parallels there. Anyways, at this point in time, smelters still relied on charcoal, right? And this is, of course, derived from wood. Therefore, this period of time where iron is taking off and there's more and more charcoal being used, this led to massive deforestation in England. In fact, Queen Elizabeth actually passed a law limiting wood use because she was concerned about this. Um, And this, obviously, if you limit it, 
There's a market response. This led to an increase in the cost of wood and therefore the cost of charcoal. And this was a big deal too, as historically charcoal had been responsible for half of the total iron smelting cost, but now rose to three fourths of the cost, putting as many as 90% of the English forges out of business. And the industrial revolution itself was threatened to a standstill if a new low cost fuel source you know, couldn't be identified. You know, there's definitely a modern parallel here, as many of our modern technologies are also dependent on electricity from fossil fuels. Um, you know, pretty limited source of energy and one with harmful envir environmental side effects. So in the face of these energy restrictions, what did blacksmiths turn to as an energy source? So coal has been known as a potential alternative to charcoal for a long time, but there was always this significant problem that coal is not super pure. In fact, it has impurities like sulfur. When sulfur alloys with iron, it tends to segregate to the grain boundaries. In a material grain boundaries, when different sections of material crystallize, these are the regions where they butt up against one another. And you know, when you get sulfur there, that can make the iron extremely brittle and prone to catastrophic failure rather than being nice and ductile, which allows you to you know, shape it and, and different things. Fortunately, at the turn of the 18th century, a guy named Abraham Darby I invented a blast furnace, which allowed for the manufacture of cast iron using coke-fired blast furnace. And coke is just coal, but you've heat treated it. And in that heat treatment process, you end up removing a lot of these impurities like sulfur. This innovation was extremely successful. It led to this major reduction in the price of iron. All of a sudden, it wasn't just this premium material that only armies could afford for things like cannons. All of a sudden, these things could be purchased by common society. And this led to a consumer driven economy. This is certainly a familiar concept, as there have been many technologies that we take for granted today that were originally developed solely for military use. Some of these include GPS, you know, the internet, digital cameras. Yeah, absolutely. Now, by 1750, coal was widely accepted in iron manufacturing, and by the end of the 18th century, charcoal was no longer being used at all. It was all used based on coal. The Industrial Revolution was once again free to build steam engines, railroads, bridges, buildings, and much more with now this low-cost iron. In fact, the first iron bridge that was ever made was by Abraham Darby's son. It went over the Severn River using 70-foot-long cast ribs. These inventions rapidly changed society in a short period of time and enabled humans to do exponentially more than they'd ever done before. However, at a certain point, society was developing new technologies and structures that were beyond the capabilities of iron. This was seen extensively in bridge development and railroads. For example, in Scotland, on December 28, 1879, the world's largest bridge at the time, the Tay Rail Bridge, collapsed under the force of strong winds. A train carrying 75 passengers plunged into the Tay River, killing all on board. In Britain as well, in the mid-19th century, railroad tracks had to be changed every three to six months due to the deformations in the iron rail tracks. Soon it became clear that, you know, a new, stronger material was needed to enable these future technologies. Okay, this finally brings us to steel. Wrought iron, cast iron, and steel, these are actually pretty closely related. They're all primarily iron, but... They also all rely critically on the addition of a small amount of carbon. One of the key differences between wrought iron, cast iron, and steel is also the actual chemical composition. In addition to the differences in carbon content, steel also typically requires careful control of other impurities, and sometimes we even intentionally alloy it or add additional elements, you know, specific additives that produce specialty alloys. So from a composition standpoint, we have four different classes of steel. You've got your carbon steel, your alloy steel, stainless steel, and tool steel. Carbon steels have something like low, medium, or high carbon concentrations, typically up to only a few weight percent carbon. Um, alloy steels have unusual alloying elements like manganese, silicon, nickel, titanium, or others, which might give some targeted properties such as weldability or ductility. The key to making a stainless steel is the addition of 10 to 20 weight percent chromium. And are, are you at all familiar with how stainless steel was discovered? No, how was it discovered? Well, Harry Brealey was an English researcher investigating new steel alloys to make gun barrels from, and during his research, he would combine various metals with steel to determine their effects. After testing, he would toss any failures into a pile in the corner of his lab. These metals would then, you know, corrode. Now, one day, he's walking past this pile of failures when he noticed that one of the failures, you know, hadn't corroded, and that that sample happened to be the barrel that he alloyed with chromium. That's incredible. Later in the season, we're going to talk about how discovering materials is so often by chance and how we can change that. But that's a cool example of it. You know, incredibly, even if you add 11 weight percent chromium, this gives a metal something like 200 times the corrosion resistance as compared to like plain mild steel. The way that it actually does it is by intentionally oxidizing. You intentionally oxidize the chromium that you add, and this forms chromium oxide on the surface, and this is what's called a passivating layer. 
A passivating layer is one that protects the underlying steel from further oxidation and corrosion. Wait, so an initial corrosion is what keeps the stainless steel from corroding further? That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, now the last steel composition type is tool steel, and these typically contain things like tungsten, molybdenum, cobalt, or vanadium, and they typically give it properties like heat resistance or durability, which is really necessary since these materials are used often for cutting or grinding. Now another key difference that sets steel apart is the ability to heat treat the steel in order to drastically alter the microstructure and associated properties. Heat treating steel goes way back to ancient days. In fact, early blacksmiths knew of a balance that had to be struck between uh, processing in order to get the blade's final properties right. They knew that if you cooled steel very rapidly, you'd get really high strength and hardness, but while that's really nice for keeping a, an edge sharp, for sharpening it for an ultra-sharp sword, if that sword was actually impacted, it was pretty brittle and it would fracture. Now, on the other hand, if you cooled it down slowly, you could make the sword or the blade very tough and ductile, but it wouldn't bend under stress and it really wouldn't hold an edge very well, so you couldn't make it very sharp. In fact, there's even been these horrifying stories passed around about blacksmiths using the bodies of slaves as quenching mechanisms. Here's one. It says, Then let the master workman, having cold hammered the blade to a smooth and thin edge, thrust it into the fire of a cedarwood charcoal in and out while reciting the prayer to the god until the steel be the color of red of the rising sun when he comes up over the desert in the east. And then with a quick motion, pass the same from the heel thereof to the point six times through the most fleshy portion of the slave's back and thighs when it shall have come to the color of the purple of the king. Then with one swing and a stroke of the right arm, the master workman severs the head of the slave from the body and display not nick or crack along the edge. Then the blade may be bent around the body of a man and break not. It shall be accepted as a perfect weapon, sacred to the service of God. The owner thereof may thrust it into a scabbard of ass's skin, brazen with brass, and hung on a girdle of camel's wool, dyed in royal purple. Okay, hold up a sec. Are you telling me that blacksmiths would use a slave's body to quench their steel? Fortunately, this is the only written record of this supposed practice, and it's actually been shown that this was a prank. There's no direct evidence that this was ever used. So the guy who wrote it, he wrote it under the name Professor von Eulenspiegel, which, you know, in our modern day would be basically like saying this was written by Dr. Seuss. Like, at the time, it was a practical joke that people in German, you know, German speakers in Germany would have known that this was a total hoax, but this, like, has been carried around for a long time. But it's probably not true. You know, nevertheless, quenching rate really does matter. It's not that you have to use slaves, but we do need to control how we remove heat from the material. So why? The answer, or the question is why? The answer has to do with the crystal structure of steel. At high temperatures, the structure is what we call face-centered cubic, or in other words, Iron atoms arrange themselves in a cubic lattice or a cubic arrangement where you put these atoms at the corners of a cube and then you also put atoms at the center of each face, hence the name face-centered cubic. The structure at room temperature, though, once you've cooled it down, it's no longer face-centered cubic. It's what we call body-centered cubic. Now you've also got these iron atoms at the corners of the cube, but instead of being centered along the faces, you have it centered at the body of the cube. And these two different structures can fit different amounts of these tiny carbon atoms in the interstitial spaces in between the iron atoms. So the high temperature structure, it can fit a lot more carbon, up to 2.14 weight percent carbon in its structure. And the low temperature structure, it can fit much less, only 0.022 weight percent carbon. Or if I put this in another way, you can cram 100 times more carbon atoms in the high temperature structure than the low temperature structure. So let's imagine for a minute that you've got a high temperature alloy with lots of carbon in it, and then you start cooling it down. Well, that carbon, as the structure switches from face center cubic to body center cubic, it's gonna have to leave the structure, and it does that by forming precipitates, precipitates of iron carbide. Iron carbide is what we call cementite because it's really strong, but it's brittle as opposed to the ductile low carbon iron. Okay, so if I have this right, the more carbon present in steel, the more cementite that will form, which leads to a harder, stronger, but more brittle steel, is that right? That's exactly right. So cast iron, for example, you remember from before that we said cast iron has lots of carbon in it. That's the reason why cast iron pots and pans, if you drop them, they're way more susceptible to fracture and breaking because they've got lots of this cementite present as opposed to, say, pure iron, which is not going to fracture very easily because it's much more ductile. Gotcha. Now, rapid quenching, what it doesn't give is enough time and temperature for this hard, brittle cementite to diffuse very far. And as a result, it ends up dispersed kind of all through the structure. Diffusion is when atoms hop and move through the lattice, typically separating in order to reduce the number of boundaries between the different phases, because boundaries cost energy. Slow cooling, on the other hand, 
When you cool it down slowly, you give it lots of time and temperature, and therefore these cementite regions can sort of pool together, and this sort of increases the ductility. Now this diffusion is dependent on energy within the system. If energy is removed from the system, then the phase will remain in its present form, even if it isn't thermodynamically favorable. Yeah, that's exactly right. If you quench it really quickly from this high temperature, you can prevent the formation of this low temperature phase altogether, and instead you form what's called a metastable phase. In this case, in steel, we call it a martensite, right? It's a martensitic transformation, and this is the hardest, strongest steel of them all, but it's also extremely prone to fracture. So martensite, in its initial form, right if you heat quench it, is not actually a very good engineering material. And they typically heat treat it again to form what's called tempered martensite. And this sort of balances strength, but also adds some toughness. Now, the last thing that influences strength and ductility steel are things called dislocations. And these can be thought of regions in the material where this nice periodic arrangement of atoms gets disrupted. Whole rows of extra atoms might be jammed into the lattice, and this creates strain all around the dislocation. Dislocations are formed, and they move through the material during deformation, such as the hammering on a piece of steel. This process is known as cold working, and as the material is deformed, more and more dislocations start to pile up in the material, which makes it increasingly difficult for them to move, which makes the material harder and harder. Okay, so is this why, you know, if you take a piece, like a, a small wire and you start bending it, the more you bend it, it actually becomes harder to bend each time? That's exactly right. In fact, if you keep on doing this, it'll eventually break. This is why blacksmiths will reheat their cold work metal back up to high temperatures over and over as they're working on it. It reduces the number of dislocations, it heals the damaged lattice, and so it becomes easily workable again and it's less likely to break. Now, the science that Taylor presented here behind steel was not actually understood, you know, on a quantum mechanical level until the late 1800s. And as such, the steel that was produced was often produced by accident. However, it was understood by many blacksmiths that certain ways of treating the iron could produce a harder, you know, metal at the end. So these processes, I imagine they were pretty heavily ritualized. You know, they'd be passed down from family member, from apprentice to, you know, from master to apprentice. And they were sort of thought of as secrets. Um, and nowhere was this more prevalent than in ancient Japan. That's right. The steel produced for samurai swords remained the hardest in the world for around 500 years. Wow. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah. So the iron used to forge samurai swords came in the form of iron sand. Now, this is a sand with heavy concentrations of iron in it in the form of magnetite. Before forging, a large clay vessel measuring 4 feet tall and 12 feet long is constructed. This is then fired from the inside using a soft pin charcoal until hard. Over the next 72 hours, charcoal and iron sand are shoveled into the vessel in alternating layers. And, you know, this process is extremely labor-intensive and requires a team of, you know, four to five people. The vessel is then continuously heated for, you know, the duration of a week to allow the carbon in the charcoal to diffuse into the iron. The steel produced through this process ranged from low to high carbon content. Now, the genius of the samurai system was that they were able to differentiate between the high and low carbon steel. They did this by examining the appearances and striking the steel pieces. Hold on a minute. So they could figure out the properties of steel just by striking it? How did that work? Yeah, so the high carbon steel was incredibly hard, but also really brittle. And they were able to identify the high carbon steel based on how easily the steel fractured. The low carbon steel was extremely tough, which allowed it to absorb high impacts. This would be used to form the core of the sword. High carbon steel would then be folded through forge welding. This folding process served to remove impurities and normalize the carbon content and ultimately strengthen the steel. The entire process was considered a sacred art and was accompanied by a large panoply of Shinto religious rituals. Additionally, specialists were involved in every aspect of the blade's construction. There was a specialist in forging, folding, polishing, a specialist for the edge itself, and even one for the sheath. The result of this ritualistic and labor-intensive process was a sword that was strong enough to withstand the impacts of other swords and remain sharp enough to cut flesh. Man, it's just amazing that all these sort of meticulous rituals, they were able to sort of bridge their gap in scientific knowledge and yet still produce this hardest steel in the world at the time. Yeah, and it wasn't even until you know the advent of metallurgy in the 20th century that stronger steel could be produced through precise control of the carbon content. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. That was in 1786. French scientists Vandemort, Bertillet, and Monge they sort of formally concluded that carbon was this essential ingredient in creating steel. Okay, so, so after this discovery, how did the production of steel in urban centers change? Well, you know, following the discovery of steel, these were primarily produced in a process known as cementation. Cementation process, basically bars of iron are packed with charcoal in alternating layers, which sounds familiar to what we've seen before. You take refractory matter, it was then used to seal this charcoal in sort of pots, um, 
Refractory matter consisted of materials that are extremely resistant to heating. So clays, talc, magnesium, these were all sort of forming the chamber and these pots were then heated for a week or longer. The irons regularly examined, the pots were eventually removed once the heat um, had accrued, once the heat was sufficient in the iron bars for them to accrue roughly one weight percent carbon. The pots were then left to cool for 14 days and the steel that was produced was called blister steel. Okay, how did it get that name? Yeah, it had to do with the surface. The surface appeared sort of as it was blistered in this initial process. Mm. So as you mentioned, the cementation process took a really long time, and it seems it wasn't very suitable for any large-scale production of steel. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, after the cementation process, another means of producing steel really became necessary, and it was developed by Benjamin Huntsman. It was known as the crucible process. Huntsman's system, it involved a furnace capable of reaching 1600 C, this would heat up 12 clay crucibles, and each crucible was holding something like 15 kilograms of iron. When these things were white hot, they were charged with blister steel in a flux. Okay, and what exactly is a flux? Yeah, so a flux serves two purposes. First off, it prevents the formation of oxides on the surface of the molten metal, and the second is it absorbs impurities within the metals. So the pots were removed after three hours in the furnace, and all these impurities in the form of slag, they were skimmed off the top. And as you mentioned, you know, as you mentioned the cementation process, both of these processes still took long periods of time um, to produce the steel, and they didn't really offer amazing control over the carbon content in the steel. And this led to some inconsistencies in the quality of the steel that was produced. Yeah, this was this is actually a huge issue for Prussian arms manufacturers in you know around the 1840s, and they were plagued by their experimental weapons malfunctioning or exploding during testing due to the inconsistencies in the properties. You know, there was a desperate need for someone to develop a process of producing steel with controllable and consistent carbon content. Now, this is where an English inventor named Henry Bessemer comes in. He devised a process of producing steel with a consistent and controllable carbon content through reactions between carbon and oxygen. So in the Bessemer process, crude, high carbon content steel was melted into a molten state and then blast with hot air. The oxygen in the air would then react with the carbon in the molten steel to form oxides that would rise to the surface in the form of slag. The slag would then be scraped off of the molten, steel, the molten steel and poured into molds. This process reduced the time it took to produce steel from days to mere hours, allowing for steel of consistent carbon content to be mass-produced for the first time. Now, the Bessemer process was not without its flaws, however. Much of the steel produced through this process turned out to be brittle, and this was actually due to high phosphorus content in English ore, which was not removed by the process. Now, this was never accounted for, as Bessemer actually developed the process using phosphorus-free Swedish ore. Okay, so as you're describing this, this all sounds pretty familiar to what we talked about earlier, which are these puddling furnaces. It is very similar. The main difference, however, is that in the Bessemer process, the iron is brought to a molten state once, and the air is pumped directly through the molten iron, which is much more effective at removing these impurities. To put it into perspective, the process to produce iron through the puddling furnace took about 12 hours, while the Bessemer process took 30 minutes. In fact, in many cases, the process removed all the carbon from the iron, while also introducing air bubbles. These flaws initially prevented the widespread acceptance of the Bessemer process. Later, an inventor named Robert Moucher improved the Bessemer process by adding a German compound called Spiegelsen, which contained iron, carbon, and manganese. The manganese would react with the oxygen bubbles to form manganese oxide and float to the surface to be removed as slag. This material also added a sufficient amount of carbon to restore the carbon content to the level needed for steel. Essentially what's happening here is the Bessemer process would remove all of the carbon and then this additive would add back the necessary carbon to produce you know, the steel with the desired carbon content they want. Now despite the importance of this contribution, Boucher received little in royalties for his contributions and was never actually acknowledged by Bessemer. That's so terrible. I know, what an evil guy. And, you know, it gets kind of worse here. So the idea of pumping air directly through molten iron was actually not unique to Bessemer. Nearly a decade before Henry Bessemer created his me method, an American iron worker in Kentucky named William Kelly came to the same conclusion. Now, Kelly applied for a patent after Bessemer had, but he was actually given precedence given that he had documents showing that he had invented this first. However, you know, even though Kelly had precedence, it was actually Bessemer who took credit for large-scale mass production of steel because the first steel rails in the U.S. were stamped Bessemer steel. So not only did he kind of like sidestep this Moucher guy, but he also blocked Kelly from getting any credit. Yeah, and history, you know, is the ultimate verdict here is we just know it as the Bessemer process. All right, so the Bessemer process, that was followed by something called the Open Hearth Furnace developed by Siemens in England and Martin in France. These furnaces, they made it possible to process phosphorus-rich ores. 
Now, the way they did this is they basically lined the furnace with refractory bricks. These reacted with the phosphorus, which would have otherwise degraded the steel. And the result is now that you've got steel that was cheaper even than wrought iron. This is a game changer. Low cost manufacturing of steel at a large scale. This paved the way for replacing all of our old products, which had been made out of iron, you know, steam engines, naval construction, bridges. These could all be made out of steel. This led to an explosion in the production of steel. Take the U.S. for example. They were making 22,000 tons annually in 1867. 13 years later, they were making a million tons annually. You know, by 1900, they were making 9 million tons. We saw similar growth in Germany going from 12,000 tons in 1850 to 8 million in 1900. Wow. And, you know, one of the most important applications of steel is in buildings. You know, prior to the 19th century, there were no skyscrapers. Building had, buildings had to be designed with thick outer walls to bear the immense, you know, compressive stress from the upper floors. Stone and cement is much stronger under compression than tension, so buildings typically relied on arches, arches or buttresses through the Middle Ages because they allowed building components to remain under compression rather than tension. Yeah, and so the result you can imagine, since you're putting things under, con- under compression, the result are these short, squat buildings that have relatively few windows because putting windows in would take away from the load-bearing walls, and that's not going to be okay. The tremendous strength of steel, on the other hand, even under tension, allowed for radical new architectural designs. Take the architect, his name was William Jenny, for example. In 1883, the home insurance company in Chicago asked him to erect a fireproof 10-story building with windows. Now, that was unheard of at the time. His revolutionary plan, it shifted the weight from the outer walls to an internal iron or steel skeleton. And this freed up all of those outer walls to be transparent windows. It wasn't long before, you know, these crowded, dense cities became populated with these enormously popular skyscrapers built from steel. Through the 20th century, we found all sorts of other cool applications for steel. It wasn't just bridges, buildings, and boats either. Many of the applications fundamentally transformed daily life for people, even to the point that, you know, we can't imagine life before steel. Consider automobiles, for example. It wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for that strong steel frame or the body panels, or even something as mundane as shaving. Can you believe that in the early 1900s, it was still common to go to a barber every couple days to get shaved with a straight razor because a straight razor was hard to keep sharp? You know, it was King Camp Gillette who decided to use cheap steel for his double-edged safety razor in order to sort of democratize shaving by making it cheap enough that you didn't have to sharpen it yourself. You could just throw it away and buy a new one. Wow, I mean, for something as important as shaving, I imagine Gillette's invention was pretty popular. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason that we know as the Gillette razor. He went from making, uh, he was selling 51 razors, and 12 years later, he was making 70 million. I'm just unreal. That's amazing. You know, another really interesting thing that I learned about steel was that the material changed after the, after the development of nuclear weaponry. You know, during the early years of the Cold War, background radiation levels increased all around the world as Russia and the U.S. were testing, you know, different nuclear weapons. As such, you know, like modern steel is contaminated with radionuclides because its production uses atmospheric air. While the amount of background radiation has, you know, since decreased, much of the steel being produced today has recycled elements that still contain these radionuclide contaminants. You know, this was not the case with steel produced, you know, before this time, which has been named low background steel, you know, because it doesn't have these radionuclides in it. And this steel is primarily used for the construction of radiation sensors, which require as little interference as possible to be accurate. And interestingly enough, the primary source of low background radi- like low background steel is from you know, retired Navy ships built during the First World War. So there you have it, a little bit on the history of steel. Who would have thought that something that we take for granted has such a colorful, interesting history that really paved the way for an enormous world events like the birth of capitalism, industrial revolution, or even the fundamental limits of governmental interaction with business? Now today, we've given you a brief overview of the history of steel, but if you think the story of steel is complete, you better think again. I am certain that we'll be devoting future episodes to the current state-of-the-art inventions involving steel. But next episode, stay tuned as we discuss entrepreneurship with a material scientist who's taking an idea involving a new material from his head all the way through the commercialization process to consumers. We think you're going to really enjoy it. We'll catch you next time. If you enjoyed the information we covered in today's podcast and want to learn even more, because you know we really only just scratched the surface, please check out our show notes or maybe take a look at some of the reference materials we used, such as the book Stuff Matters by Mark Miodownik or The Substance of Civilization by Stephen L. Sass. If you have questions, please send us an email at materialism.podcast at gmail.com and make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts.
Finally, check out our Instagram page at materialism.podcast and connect with us to let us know what new materials you'd like to hear about next. A special thanks to Colabyte, who created the music for our podcast. He makes a ton of really cool synthwave music, which you can check out at colabyte.bandcamp.com. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. 